Okay, I'll use it. You need to use that anyway. What? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you, you don't know it, but that was my favorite joke on Margo when we built our house in Boise. It's because there were these TV commercials. That's a little loud, Sharon. Anyway, there were these TV, TV commercials about hearing aids, and every time they'd come on, I'd say, what? And she'd fall for it. I mean, every time. <laughs> No. Finally! The trouble with it, Gerald, is when I say what, I really mean what. Well, now it got to be a cry wolf sort of thing, so. So I thought, thought I ought to start with, hi, I'm new here. <laughs> but I think I've met some of you before. Uh, yeah, it's been a lot, of, a lot of traveling, which is fine with me. I don't mind that, but... Um, so first I thought I'd just kind of take a poll of why are you here? You know, how many of you are here because you live here? Oh, come on, you guys. You raise your hands. <laughs> Johnny and Mary are abstaining for some reason. So, <laughs> no, I mean not here, 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 here. So some people don't have any place else to go. I don't. I don't think there's anybody in that category here. And some people go where their presents are, so, you know, they're kind of like retrievers. What I wanted to talk about today was good news. Now, as I'm prone to do, I always take that phrase and divide it up into its two parts, and, you know, we'll get maybe a little analytical, but hopefully not too much. But, ironically, <laughs> news is a subject that's in the news these days. So, so let me ask you what, and I'll say what good news have you had recently? Anybody had any good news? Yeah, my brother. There you go. Inch of rain, three, or third of an inch of rain. Cleon's here and made it. That's the good news. Your kids are on the, on the way. That's just news. We don't know if that's good news or not. So, and, and this question is specifically for John. It's his Christmas present. Where do you get news from? And I have the dangling participles particularly for John. <laughs> it's like the star on his alphabet tree. But really, to rephrase it, what, what is the source of your news? Anybody? This is not intended to be a lecture, by the way. TV. Okay, television? It's all kinds of media. Okay, specifically though, what kind of media? Facebook. Okay, Facebook? Okay, radio? Anybody still listen to the radio? Yeah, some people do. If I'm traveling, I always listen to it. Okay. How many of you get your news from a newspaper? Online. Okay, online. Okay. But very little of it's printed anymore, right? Unless you print it from something you saw online. I, I think it's important that we recognize how the history of, of news, and I'll call some of it information, uh, has, has progressed. Because media is simply that. It's what carries information. Okay? And so I wanted to talk a little bit about it in the context of, of the good news of the Messiah's birth. But really, we need to think about all of the information that we get. Now, we would like it all to be good. And, and that's another perspective I'd like to ask is, what makes news good? And is news universally good? Is news as good for me as it is for John or David or Teresa? And why? So what makes news good to you? Okay, content. But content is... if I like it. Okay. If I like it. Now why, why might you like it, Cleon? 
Well, that d would depend on your uh, <clears throat> perspective, but if it is something that agrees with me or something that I agree with, or something that might bring me joy, something that might bring me uh, some sort of value. For somebody else, maybe. Or, yeah. You know, yeah, it, it may not really affect me, but it might affect somebody I know. Yeah, it improves either your situation or your view of your situation. John? Yeah, I was just thinking you were talking about news and, and how little we see printed. But I, Dad is still getting Time Magazine. <laughs> so I, 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 will, I will look at that. And when Cleon started to talk, it reminded me yesterday had just a beautiful story in the Time Magazine of four little children that were born from mothers who barely got out of Aleppo. Mm -hmm. And these four little children, you know, they had darling pictures. And it was that, it was that feeling of hearing this horrible destruction and, and the hatred. Beautiful new babies. Their mothers were healthy. The babies were healthy. And even though they'd been through a harrowing experience, there was this sense of all is well. Yeah. That, that there's an, a salvation, an escape. Every so often, you'll hear somebody, something that even though your world may be out of control, makes you believe it, it's not totally out of control. Right. And in the context of, of God and, and His plan, those are the sorts of things that bring us what I would call joy, because they're an understanding of the spiritual truth of things. And it's, that's, that's why I like the, to use the term joy this time of the year, because joy is not happiness and laughter and it's knowing that things are under control in a good way okay so anything that we hear um, we would call along those lines we would call good news okay so Teresa well, good news is interesting news. okay so if it's, if it's a topic of interest to you and then when you read it you have some something anyway that people are telling you it expands your understanding. Now that in turn makes you feel like you have more value. Okay? Most of these things to me boil down to a value proposition. They increase your value somehow. And and if I, I was just thinking of Isaiah eleven, you know, where it talks about the lampstand. There's this spirit of, of Yahweh in the middle, which I take to be creation, but this sense that I can build something. And the sense of wisdom, I, I know what to do, the sense of understanding that I'm not confused about where things are and how they work. And then there's counsel. I, I'm able to, to share or for other people to share with me. And there's power to actually accomplish good things. And then there's knowledge, which is the intimacy with our Creator. And there's the fear of the Lord, which has nothing to do with being afraid. It's this understanding of how great and really in how much control He holds creation. And, and that brings respect. And so pretty much all good news will fall into, into one of those arenas. Now what's bad news? Come on, you guys, just, you know, invert this. What's the antonym to good? It's bad. <laughs> okay, now, I would submit to you that bad news is more threatening to us than good news is inspiring to us. Well, for a while, uh, because of, uh, I guess, the proliferation of bad news, the phrase, no news is good news. Hmm. So if you, don't, if you don't hear any news at all, it's really good. It would, you would prefer, prefer to, not to, to not hear that things are going bad. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so, but really isn't that analogous or comparable to what it says, what, what Yeshua says, that I want you to either be hot or cold, because in the middle you're pretty much worthless. Because if you're not for me, you're against me. See, God wants us to have this positive engagement with whatever is going on. He wants the kingdom to be built, not just to exist at some level. Okay. What's the third kind of news? We had good news and bad news. Yeah. 
It's fake news. It's fake news. Okay? Now, how many of you thought that was a new term within the last month or so? Well, suddenly got a lot of currency. Well, and, and it's just, just because we don't talk about it much. But I went back and I looked. All three of these are mentioned in, in the Bible. And it's interesting that good news is not often translated that way. It's just news that is good. And news in the Old Testament is the idea of a report. It's just something that's distributed. And so good news is, is a report that, that brings some value to something. But bad news is a completely separate word. And by the way, news in the context of a report <laughs> Is its root word is Shema. It's, it's to hear, to tell, to receive, and it has that same implication of action. You, you need to deal with everything that's presented to you. Now, sometimes that's to say, that doesn't apply, and you just file it. But if it affects you, you need to deal with it somehow. Now, sometimes that means you hold it for later. Sometimes that means immediate action. You know, stoplights are pretty much immediate news, and, and you act on them. But fake news is described by a word. Uh, did you talk about Genesis 37 and, and Joseph and the story of his brothers last week? Yes. You remember when it said Joseph brought an evil report about his brothers to his father? Yeah. That's fake news. That's news with an evil intent. Its intent is to deceive or demean and the Bible's very specific about not creating false reports. It's a form of false witness. Because it doesn't just communicate information, it makes a judgment. And in my view, we don't receive much news these days. We receive opinion. Somebody is always trying to get us to do something rather than just provide us information. So we need to be aware of that. When we get information, unfortunately now, we have to be the judges of its quality and its intent. Okay? Now, that's why good news. We know good news when we hear it, at least as far as we're informed. If somebody lied to us and wanted us to think it was good news, that's a different story. That's deception. But I wanted to also look at the, at the way it's translated in the New Testament because we use the word gospel, but we kind of throw it around. But the Greek word is really the word evangelize. It just means to take a message and spread it around. So the gospel as a word really doesn't have a meaning beyond that, the action of spreading information. Now, we've capitalized it and you know, done a lot of things with it, but. But in the context of news, before we get too far into gospel, what does new mean? See, we use the term news, but why? So what does new mean? Think of all of the, the uses of the term new and, and what they mean to you. Okay, haven't heard it before. It's outside your experience. Okay. What else? Never existed before? You know, when somebody says that's new, what do they mean? It may be new to them, like Betsy says. It may, in <laughs> fact, be new. Nobody has seen it before. Okay, it could mean fresh. You know, when, when you go to the cupboard in, or your refrigerator and you look in there and say, that's not new. <laughs> Usually those things have a fuzz over the top of them. So I'd say fresh. And sometimes this is kind of a nuance, but it means unused. Okay, if somebody else has used something then it's not new, it's not original, you know, it's been in process. And there's renewed, okay? It's, it's like you would do with a car. Now, when you say 
in the context of renewed, that means that it was brought back to the way it was when it was originally created. Okay, that's different from renovation or remodeling. Okay, so don't ever apply new to your house once you've moved in. Because once you walk through the door, your house is no longer new. Now, you may not be able to walk around at night, and, and I loved the little thing I saw the other day that God created little toes to find things in the dark. Okay, now you may be unfamiliar with it, but it may not be new. Okay, so what is new, what does it not mean? It doesn't mean better. Okay, we, we want to be careful with that because our advertising, when it says it's new, it usually says and improved. But it does not mean better. It's probably had a paint job. But it may mean different. And I think in the context of what God does, we always have to be careful with different. Because we have our comfort zones and things that are outside of our experience are new to us. But we have to be careful about the value judgment. But because they're different doesn't make them bad, doesn't necessarily make them good. Sometimes it's just different. Like Cleon says, good or bad may come from our personal reaction to what we're hearing or experiencing. So in the context of gospel, good news, what was new? In fact, what is the gospel in your opinion? What was the good news? Okay, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. A savior is born. What else? There are a lot of things that go underneath that. Um, let me just read you a couple of quick uh, scripture quotes that, that I thought helped me understand it a little bit. This is out of Luke 2. It says, when the angel came. Um, so I'll start with verse 9. It's talking about the shepherds. He says, The angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. Was that the good news? I mean, it was news that the angel showed up, but, but was that the good news? You know, angels had showed up before. You see it in Daniel and other places. And then it says, the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Well, for all the people isn't the good news either. I mean, it's, it's part of the value that's there. But that's still not the news. We, we don't know what's bringing the value yet. And then it says, today in the city of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. And if you want to turn that around... I think it helps my understanding, at least, to say he is the anointed one of Yahweh. You have to be careful with Lord in, in the New Testament because sometimes it's in the context of Adonai and sometimes it's in the context of, of the Father, Yahweh. But that was the good news, is that Yahweh had sent the anointed one. Okay. Now, what we need to have this sense of is that God has done something. He put a process in motion. He made it real on this earth. And that's the good news. Because prior to that time, everybody was waiting. At that time, the process started. And as Jessica said, and you look in Matthew 24... Probably ought to just go there. First off, he says, watch out that no one deceives you. That would be fake news, by the way. For many will come in my name cl claiming I am the Messiah and will deceive many. Okay? So you have to trust that the news you got in the first place was good and you're going to hang on to it. We have a tendency to discount things that, that are old, that have aged. They become familiar and comfortable. And we start to think like an old car that's still getting us around. Boy, I sure would like a new model. Well, why? Well, because it's new. So, 
So we have to be careful that, that we hang on to the, to the basic principles. Then it goes on, farther on down, it says, This good news of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So we understand that this is going to be a process. Now I was thinking about it in headline form. What would this have looked like in the Jerusalem Gazette? You know. <coughs> Yahweh sends Messiah. Project will take 2,000 years to complete. <laughs> that, that wouldn't be quite as satisfying as expecting it to come tomorrow or in the first hundred years. Okay. And if you go back and look at Hebrews 11, it's a testimony to all those who were waiting. Okay. So, so that's something we need to understand about the gospel. Jesus said, I have to go preach this good news in all these other towns because that was why I was sent. Now what he went to preach was that God had sent the Messiah. That, that the issue of sin in the world was going to be dealt with. And, and that's good news for the nation, but it's personal good news. And, you know, like we've heard in, is it, is it John 8? Luke 8. Anyway, where Jesus says if they couldn't accept, if they couldn't accept John, they couldn't accept me. Luke 7. Luke 7. It's the, that preparatory work. And not everybody was prepared because Jesus stood and looked over Jerusalem and says, I would have gathered you under my wings, but you would not. So we can understand why this process takes a while. And God in his own mercy makes us more susceptible to news. He prepares us for it when it's time. And, and it's a good thing he doesn't shove it down our throats because most of us would choke at some point. But we need to understand that the good news, excuse me, the good news is that God did something. And he is still doing something, by the way. I mean, as we go through our generations, people die and people are born. And we, each one of us, have to be exposed to this, to this good news. Uh, just one more thing about the good news. This is from Acts. This is when they were in the, with the Sanhedrin. Uh, in Acts 5, it says, it says, Day after day in the temple courts, from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Yeshua is the Messiah. See, that's the central point. Now, it started with him being born. And that's what the angels were proclaiming was the start of this process. But the truly good news is that the Messiah has come. Now it was interesting, there's an article in the, in the Wall Street Journal and uh, it's called Why This Rabbi Loves Questions, or Loves Christmas, excuse me, I have questions written down here. And I want to read a, a good chunk of this. John, I don't know how much time you want me to take or... Okay. I found this to be really interesting, why this rabbi loves Christmas. Because one of the things that Christians struggle with is, well, and, and they have ever since Yeshua was, was uh, killed, is um, why don't the Jews accept this? Why can't the Jews accept this? Well, the fact is they can't. It's not time yet. If you read through, you can understand why that has to be. but. For individual Jews, it's really tough. And it's probably fortunate that Hanukkah starts along with Christmas at this season, because then you don't have this separation between the two celebrations. But I appreciated this guy. He's a rabbi from a conservative congregation in, in Southern California. He says, Christmas fascinates me. I'm drawn to its history, its color, its atmosphere, its music. And of course, I'm drawn to the fact that Jesus was a Jew. He was born a Jew, lived as a Jew, and died a Jew. And if nothing else, I can appreciate Christmas as a celebration of one Jew's epic birthday. The 20th century philosopher and theologian Martin Buber would often begin lectures and ecumenical gatherings by stating, 
that a key difference between separating Jews and Christians is whether Jesus was the Messiah. Christians believe he was and they are awaiting his return. Jews believe that the Messiah hasn't yet come. His suggestion? Let's all pray for the Messiah, Christians and Jews alike. When he arrives, we'll ask if he's been here before. <laughs> While I am a religious Jew and Judaism unequivocally promotes belief in a Messiah, that concept sometimes puzzles me. My difficulty with the notion of a Messiah is not an issue of faith. That's too personal to argue. The question is, if the Messiah to, were to appear, or reappear, what would he say that hasn't already been said? I assure you there would be nothing new, no surprises. Let that sink in a little bit. Not in a judgmental sort of way, but to understand what the perspective is that, that without the Gospels, the New Testament that we have, there's a portion of what God is doing that's not visible. The Messiah would likely declare that we shouldn't treat fellow human beings like objects and that we shouldn't steal from one another. To bring peace to the world, the Messiah would certainly demand, love your neighbor as yourself, don't murder, especially in the name of God, don't commit adultery, and don't bear false witness. He would no doubt add that personal and universal redemption requires that we not gossip, manipulate others, or act deceitfully, and that we should channel and refine our base impulses. This would help us become kinder, humbler, and more human. All of us are well familiar with these timeless moral instructions, the result of our affiliation with churches and synagogues. Such lofty principles are hardwired into the universal Judeo-Christian ethic. A Messiah need not repeat them. Even if his message isn't fresh, many idealize the Messiah as a personal redeemer, a force capable of divine superhuman power. Who hasn't prayed for miraculous intervention? Whether it be for help to overcome a personal obstacle or for a loved one to survive a deadly disease, what is one to do when no more human interventions are available? Given that life is not merely physical, we all have a spiritual dimension that requires attention. Humans naturally search for a superhero. By the way, Superman was the creation of a Jew, if you didn't know that. Something to apprehend the bad guy, to stop the disease from spreading, to change human nature and the physical order of the universe and save the day. A messianic belief can help fill that yearning. It has for me. Yet the issue isn't necessarily the Messiah. To think so is to take one's eye off the theological ball. The real issue is God. The Messiah can become a veil. It can separate us from the primary source. I'd prefer to blame or praise God directly and not through a messianic filter. With Judaism, rabbinic law has become a potential veil between the individual and God. Rulings on Jewish law are too often engulfed in a labyrinth of hair-splitting debate. Not uncommonly, its resolve depends on the authority of the particular rabbi or academy. The forest is too often lost amid the trees. So while Christians ask, what would Jesus do? Jews ask, what does Jewish law say? That's completely understandable from a traditional Jewish perspective, and it is often praiseworthy. But I wish Jews would learn from their Christian cohorts and ask directly, what would God say? Just as the prophet Micah did by asking, what does God require of us? Christmas and its celebration of the birth of Jesus compels me to think about the concept of a Messiah. I am grateful to my Christian neighbors and friends. Through their religious holy day, I am better able to confront and clarify my own religious convictions and theological certitudes. Like a brightly lighted Christmas tree, Christianity depends a lot on, dispels a lot of darkness, theological as well as moral. In its glow, it challenges Christians and non-Christians alike to consider what is transcendent, eternal, and greater than us all. Merry Christmas, indeed. Yeah, that is a different Jew. So just a couple of other things. You know, we recognize we're in a time period. We have our own life that God is going to work through us. And this gospel that the Messiah has come and that he made the sacrifice that was necessary 
is what we base all of the rest of our life on, if we're in the Messiah. But what do we do during that time? You know, Scripture says, wait upon the Lord. Well, what does that mean? I mean, what's the definition of wait? See, I was thinking about the example of, a, of crossing an intersection that has, has lights. Now, what are the two lights that are, that are there for the pedestrians? Wait and go. Wait and go, or walk. Okay. Well, walking we understand. But what does wait mean? See, to a lot of Christians, it's like, well, I'm going to wait until God tells me something to do. Now, if you use that definition at the intersection, you would have a whole pile of people around this pole where the light is, because they would never move. Oh, wait, well, I, I guess I better stop here until somebody makes me move. But the word that's used, particularly in Hebrew, for wait has more of an interpretation or a, a definition of expect. It has nothing to do with lack of movement or lack of interest. It all has to do with understanding what the next event might be. And so we need to have this sense, now that the Messiah has come, like it says in Matthew, this gospel is going to be, of the kingdom is going to be spread throughout the whole world. Okay, well, are we going to wait for that to be done? Or are we going to be part of that to be done? I mean, God calls some people to be more actively engaged than others. But the point about good news is that you're supposed to pass it on. You know, it's like the parable of the, of the talents. If you bury it and keep it to yourself, you lose it. So we have to at least be actively engaged in our expectation. Any opportunity we see, we ought to take it. So, how good are you at waiting? And I was thinking, I first came up with this question in the, with the vision of small children and Christmas presents. Now, how good are they at waiting? It was interesting, I saw a clip on a TV program yesterday and they had brought two otters onto this set and they had a bunch of boxes wrapped up. And the otters just dove into the boxes, tore the paper apart. They weren't waiting for anything because they were curious. And I guess that's my point is that if nothing else, curiosity helps with the waiting. Because one of the things God does for us when we wait is he takes the opportunity to prepare us for what's coming next. And, and there, were just, there were two examples. The first was the shepherds in the field. You remember what their response was after the angels came and told them the good news of the Messiah being born? Yeah, let's go see what's going on. This great thing we've heard, let's go see. Now, that would be a great attitude for us when we encountered something new, either brand new or outside our experience, is to say, let's go do something with this. Okay? The second one is in Levitical Writings 146. It says, I say to my people, if there is a single thing found in my works which shall cause you to fall, pick it up and take it with you. For it is good that you should know it better. Take all truth where it may be found. Truth should be good news, by the way. Take all truth where it may be found. Hold fast to it, for in it you may learn the law, God's instructions, to your own good. This is good for us. Now, the thing we have to remember is that this is a metaphor. When it says, pick it up and take it with you, that's got to be something you do in your understanding. It is not an excuse to hoard or not clean your room. Okay? You cannot tell your parents, if you're a child, that, well, God said to take it with me. And, by the way, in, in our legal system, it could be theft, so you, <laughs> you want to be careful about that, too. But the point is, the good news has come. God started this process, and... As we understand it, he's closing in on the end of this particular phase. Okay, he has just about had the gospel of the kingdom preached throughout the whole world. 
And we need to, in our waiting, be waiting to do our job when he, when he brings us into the picture. And actually he has. But right now we're doing a lot of preparing still. We're trying to get our act together. But in our waiting, let's be curious. Say, how does that work? What does that mean? How can I pass this on to somebody? And the only way we can know how that works, because the thing that came with the good news was the Holy Spirit. The only way that we can know what to do with our curiosity is to have the guidance that God gives through the Holy Spirit. He puts us in circumstances and situations, and he tells us that he won't uh, trap us there. There will be a way of escape. But that's really a survival instinct. What we want is, what's the good thing to do that promotes the good news? And so we want to be bearers of good news. Hopefully we can do that uh, during this season as we share with our family and friends and take it back. And like Yeshua said, take this to all the nations. So, shalom. Thanks, Gerald. We appreciate that. Now we've got our new generation. Are you going to go to show party? I feel it's better today. Uh oh. Oh. About five minutes? Okay. Luke chapter. Luke chapter 2, verse 14. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. All right, you can be dismissed to your classes. Something about that feels like a race. Yeah. <laughs>